Hey everybody, Chris here from Lifeline EMS Training. Today we're going to talk about asthma. So uh, when we're talking about asthma, we always like to use things or analogies that help the brain remember what is going on or what is wrong. So for asthma, we're going to use squeezing buttery thick tubes. And while that sounds super awkward right now, it'll make a lot more sense here in a little bit. So When we look at the uh, airway problems or trouble, we think of things like, uh, is it a tube issue or a sac issue? So is it a bronchial structural issue in any of the tubes, whether that's trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, or is it a sac issue? So what are the sacs? Those are the alveoli. So here's our picture of our airway, right? We have on the left, we have the trachea. So trachea which leads to the bronchi and then down to the bronchioles, bronchioles to the alveoli. Now, if we're looking at the trachea and the bronchi here, we note that they have these semi-cartilaginous rings. So we have these semi-cartilaginous rings that prevent them from collapsing. So if they can't collapse, they also can't constrict or dilate. And in that instance, they don't really change much when we're talking about airway structural change or airway structural compensation or airway obstructive issues with the exception of the fact they may be blocked. So something may have gone down or lodged or um, become blocked within that area versus the bronchioles, which are wrapped in smooth muscle. They can also inflame and they also have those goblet cells inside that can make that lung butter or that mucus. So then we come down here to the sacs of the alveoli, which are wrapped in our capillary beds. And those are the ones that expand wide and out with uh, essentially the same action as a balloon. When we think about alveolar function, we want it to be wide, thin, so the gas can easily exchange across that membrane. So what is asthma, right? So asthma is that overreactive or hyperreactive um, immune-like response in the airway. And it really is a bronchial issue. So the bronchioles in this instance, the vascular, the uh, bronchial smooth muscle here gets tight and pinches down on them. So what does that do? It takes your big straw and turns it into a little coffee straw. The actual tissue itself or the lumen itself becomes inflamed from that immune response. So that wall density increases, which makes the area to which gas can move in and out smaller. And then you have those goblet cells on the wall that are making mucus, thinking that, hey, we have an infectious response, we have a pathogen, let's go and make fly paper to get it stuck and get it out of the system. So then you have that thick mucus on the wall, which makes the tubes even smaller. So if we think about asthma, just to sum it up real quick before we dig into it, it's really a tube problem. It's a bronchial problem. It's a bronchial reactive problem. And the, vast, the bronchial smooth muscle the wall inflammation, and the lung butter, mucus production, is what makes the size of the tube to which you breathe in and out much smaller. And you're going to hear us use the term lung butter pretty regularly because we want your brain to delineate the difference between mucus, lung butter, sticky, nasty, thick, and edema. So in other airway modules, we'll talk about pulmonary edema or drowning patients who have aspirated, you know, pool water, salt water, whatever. That's liquid. That goes, settles down in the alveoli. This mucus or this lung butter is produced in the bronchioles by those goblet cells. And we want your brain to remember that that sits there in the middle. And it's that increase in mucus production and that sticky nastiness, why you get ronchi and the bronchi when you're listening to lung sounds. So here's kind of a picture of what you would expect to... Uh, see if you were thinking about, hey, what does asthma represent? Well, this is like a clogged, dirty, nasty pipe, right? So you would get constriction of the pipe here. You would get that nasty lung butter here. And then you would get thickening of the wall here. And if you look what's happened to this pipe, this is the only amount of area that whatever was going through this pipe before can now move. And that's really kind of pictorially what asthma is is that train train whistle effect. You've taken the same volume of gas you're trying to move through a smaller orifice, so what do you get? You get backup. When you get backup, trying to move the same volume through a smaller orifice, you get increased pressure and increased resistance. 
And that's kind of the catalyst or the issue we have here with our asthma. So we have that lung butter. We have those um, cells that are goblet cells that are making or increasing that mucus production on the wall, which its job is to get the pathogens, the nasty junk you breathe in 12 to 20 times a minute. When you think about the most vulnerable areas to infection on our body, it's the respiratory tract is number one, right? It's dark, damp, and we're introducing external uh, or environmental gas 12 to 20 times a minute on average. So we're bringing in whatever nasty environmental stuff you have into that airway path, which is essentially a glorified Petri dish. So we want these cells to be generating this mucus on a regular basis so that it can kind of capture whatever nastiness you have in. And then on the walls, you have cilia. You have these hair-like structures, which kind of ladder or walk up that mucus junk, which is why you... <coughs> Firstly, cough as you walk it up and then hopefully get it out of your system. That's what it should do normally. Now, when you have an overreactive response, right? Like, let's say you have a robber come in your house and you don't just get one police officer, you get 10 SWAT teams plus the army. That's the issue we have with asthma. It's this overreaction to an insult or an ish trigger point or an issue. So, as opposed to making some mucus, the body makes a lot of mucus, plus the inflammation, plus the muscle squeezing. So we want this normally to be there. We just don't want it to be all the time in a heavy amount. And then again, that smooth muscle, right? We need this. So when we're outside running and we're not able to take as efficient of a deep breath because we're running and we're breathing faster and more and we're trying to get CO2 out and bring more oxygen in. And we're also trying to uh, draw blood back up to the heart. Little fun fact that we'll hit on a bunch of times when we're talking about respiratory is venous blood returns to the heart, the right side of the heart through respiration and muscle movement. I'll say that one more time. Venous blood returns to the right side of the heart through respiration. The negative pressure of breathing draws the blood into the thorax and muscle movement. Muscles squeezing the vasculature, the blood vessels, which are not under pressure, back to the core. So uh, you lay somebody flat on their back and you put a tube in their throat. You start power bagging them with lots of volume. What's that going to negatively do to venous return to the heart? it's going to make it much less. We'll hit on that a bunch. I just want to throw it out as many times as I can because I know I was taught wrong. I was taught that venous return to the heart happens through the pressure of the heart pumping blood out, but that is not true. That pressure stops at the capillary beds and you require negative pressure on the venous side to draw blood back up into the core. So going back to this, we need that bronchial smooth muscle to help us constrict and dilate on normal necessity for changes in delivery to our alveoli. So if our, we have an increased workload from running, we have an increased workload because we're bending over trying to chainsaw up a tree, this bronchial smooth muscle may constrict to help drive that pressure and that volume down to the alveoli because we're breathing faster, we're not getting a good deep breath, or we're crunched or hunched over, inhibiting our diaphragm's ability to get good motion. So this helps compensate for the normal breathing process and the delivery of gas down and out of the alveoli. It's something we need every day. It's when it gets overly excited and triggered and puts the bronchioles into a headlock, it becomes a problem for us. And then last is that inflammation of the wall, right? So if we're looking down these tubes here, we want we have some mild inflammation at the top and we have severe inflammation at the bottom. Look just by inflaming the vasc the bronchial lumen, what happens to the size of the orifice of that tube, right? It grossly becomes smaller. And the smaller it is, the more resistance you have. The more resistance you have, the more work you have to do to get gas past that resistance. And that's what fatigues asthmatics. As they work hard to draw air in, past that resistance, and then passively exhale out, they get tired. And how do we make the sounds, right? What are the sounds of asthma? We get wheezing. One of the best ways to represent 
asthmas that take a balloon. So if you think about a balloon, this will be our alveoli. This will be our bronchial. So if you breathe in, that should be the normal size or function of your alveoli. You breathe in, it expands, you breathe out, right? We're putting resistance on this right here. And that resistance you hear is making that squeaky sound, that train whistle sound, that high pitch sound. That's wheezing. Wheezing is you have a larger volume retained in the alveoli, like we talked about, and trying to push past that narrow, restrictive bronchoconstriction. You think about normal breathing, right? Inspiration, active. Diaphragm goes down, requires that work, makes negative pressure in the thorax, draw air in. Exhalation is passive. So normally when you breathe, it's one second in to about two to three seconds out. When you put constriction on those bronchioles, you actually make it harder to get that volume out. So you get some retention or air trapping. So that asthmatic has to work harder to get that gas out. Over time, you get that engorging alveoli. When those lungs start to engorge, 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 what else do you get? You get fatigue from them working harder but you also get them pushing on that big blue squishy blood vessel in the thorax, the vena cava, that gets no love. Severe asthmatics, you'll see their pulse ox going down because it's hard for them to get <clears throat> fresh gas in from this super restriction and this back pressure, and you'll see their blood pressure start to go down. And when their blood pressure goes down, their heart rate will go up even higher to compensate for that drop in pressure. So there's some of the telltale signs of using sound and understand what's going on to discern the severity of your patient. What if the lung sounds were silent though? You watched, you looked at your patient, you recognize they have a history of asthma, they're having trouble breathing, they're tripoding to try and streamline their airway. And then you see them breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, and you go to listen to their lungs and you don't hear any air movement. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing. Lung sounds occur when air moves through the tube and creates that resonance against the walls of the bronchi, bronchioles, trachea as well, right? If the bronchioles are so tight that you have minimal air movement, you're not going to get enough flow and resonance to make sound. And if you don't make sound, that means you're not moving good air. If you're not moving good air, you don't get good gas exchange. If you don't get good gas exchange, that's when your patients crash, right? So cause and effect with asthma. We want to know what are some of the things that cause and affect them. Well, you can have allergy-induced asthma, right? Springtime comes around, you can have pollen that triggers them. Don't forget fall. Fall when all the leaves fall and it gets damp and moist, you get mold that grows underneath. Mold spores are very prominent. Person moves into a new home. Person's renovating a home. Person goes to a new workplace. Any of those things <clears throat> can trigger this. You hear, always hear exercise-induced asthma. There's a couple of factors with that, right? The branching of the nerves to the bronchioles, What you know? because for a muscle to work, it has to be innervated because the muscle has to get a stimulant stimulation to trigger its action, those innervations come off the upper thoracic spine. So if a person has a compressed spine and is constantly accordioning it as they're running, they may be triggering those nerves to trigger those muscles to constrict. So that's one area you'll hear people talk about is when they do like running activity and they have spinal issues, they can get triggering of their bronchial smooth muscle through the nerves coming off the spine being impacted. The other you commonly see is cold, dry air. Cold, dry air outside is bronco reactive. So outside, you go and run, it's cold, it's dry, humidity is low, and you're increasing the amount of breaths in, breaths out, breaths in, breaths out. You can actually irritate the bronchioles in that capacity. You can dry them out, frustrate them, and got, get them to trigger an asthmatic response if you have that history. 
So one of the best things you can do with those individuals is take them out of that environment, get them into a warm, more moist environment as you're doing your assessment and treating them, because what you're doing is you're taking them away or out of that catalyst. So how do we combat the asthma? Well, it's not too hard. Uh, the number one thing you commonly hear is nebulizers, right? So nebulizer is taking medication and putting it into a chamber and using gas like oxygen here to push against it, create resistance, and then make little bubbles or nebulization. So unlike steaming water, you're not using heat to change the state of the liquid. You're using pressure to push against a little cap and to create a nebulization so that those droplets of medications can get down to the lower portion of the airway. There's a couple different types of meter dose inhalers. You have this puffer here on the right where you would shake it up, have the person put, take a deep breath out, put it in their lips. And then as they breathe in, you push down on the top and try and time it with them. So if you're assisting them, this one similar, you click it back and it's almost like a little gun. You, you click it back and then they they on their own, there's a little flutter valve in there that when they take a breath in and create that negative pressure, they draw, it opens up and they draw the uh, dose in with them and has a dose counter here. This one's charged. You it has a battery in it. You can turn it on and it's essentially a portable nebulizer. So it's a portable aerator of the chemical. So you put the medication in the bottom and it creates the misting effect um, through an electromechanical mechanism. Here's a close-up picture of that nebulizer cartridge, right? We put our liquid here in the bottom. We drip our albuterol and atrovent, and then the gas comes up here. This is the resistance point. So once it hits here, it actually breaks up the liquid and then turns it into droplets and then aerosolizes up and into the patient. These are the common vessels you see for albuterol and atrovent. You cross-check. They'll have the labeling of the wording here. Twist this top off like you see, and then turn this upside down. You just pinch these little vials. Mm -hmm. So what's our meds of choice? Meds of choice for asthma, our go-to is albuterol and atrovent. And they do two different things. Albuterol helps with the inflammation of the wall and really that bronchial smooth muscle, that constricting effect. It helps release that or relax that. So it's a beta-2 agonist. It helps with the bronchial smooth muscle in the lungs and as well as the inflammation. Atrovent is an antiparasympathetic, which means it works best on blocking that goblet cell lung butter production, the mucus production. So albuterol helps with bronchial smooth muscle relaxation and wall inflammation. Excuse me. And atrovent helps with uh, inhibiting that lung, lung butter production. Now, if you had a patient who had a pneumonia, and so they had a localized reaction in one area. So when you listen to the lung sounds, you would not hear that wheezing on both sides necessarily. You would hear it on one side or one area. And that's where the infection is. So in that area, let's say they breathed in some nasty mold spore or something, and it's created that reaction in that area that you're still going to get the constriction. You're still going to get the inflammation. You're still going to get the lung butter. And it's going to be isolated to one lobe or one side. If you believe that person has that pneumonia, you may or may not opt based on your protocol to withhold the atrovent. Because if you know the reason for this wheezing or this situation, this trouble breathing is from pneumonia, which is potentially from an infection, you don't necessarily want to inhibit that butter production. You want to help them open up from that inflammatory and that constrictive portion so that they can get the pathogen that's stuck to that flypaper butter up and out. So you may withhold atrovent knowing that in that instance, they need the lung butter production to help with the infectious response. So what does an asthmatic look like on a monitor? Well, here's a, here's a picture of what you may or may not see, right? So you have an elevated heart rate because they're under a stressed state. They're having trouble getting the gas in. So you see this here with a tachycardia. Breath rate is up, right? They're trying to increase the respirations. Is there SpO2 down? Maybe slightly. So like we hit on earlier, because they're constricted or pinched, they can get that backing up 
of their alveoli. So they may, as those alveoli become more and more engorged, as the bronchoconstriction becomes worse and worse and worse, it's going to be harder for them to get that gas that they're bringing in past that <clears throat> retained gas in the alveoli. So as they get sicker and sicker and sicker, you will start to see this go down. But at the end of the day, asthma is a tube problem. It's a ventilation problem. Their issue is because the bronchioles are getting tighter, they have trouble getting the gas out of their alveoli. They have trouble ventilating the gas out. The other thing, if you use capnography, you'll see is you'll see this curve or the shark fin here because this C phase, which is representative of the bronchial portion of ventilation, because they're becoming constricted, <clears throat> this starts to go away. So that one of the telltale signs of a person who has bilateral bronchoconstriction is this curving of the end tidal wave. So that's a overview of asthma. Uh, like always, if you have any questions, hit us up at info at lifelineemstraining.com. I hope you have a good rest of the day and check out some of the other ones we have available for you.